Good afternoon. Welcome to the Hope and Healing Center and our presentation today. We have about 180 people uh, online and we had about 40 people registered to be here in person. So I'm sure a few more will show up as we go through. So uh, we're very excited uh, today for our presentation. This is the second in uh, a multi-part uh, series, uh, the A.J. Weisberger uh, Education Series in Addiction uh, that was so graciously funded by Mark and Camille Weisberger in honor of their son, AJ, and we thank them for that. Uh, and uh, this is, as I said, the second in our next uh, presentation in this. In fact, Vaughn will be back for our next presentation is October 20th at noon. So you might mark that on your calendars if you're interested in continuing to learn about addiction uh, and the family. And uh, we have a number of presentations throughout uh, this, uh, this fall season uh, in that series. So please uh, check that out. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our uh, speaker today and then Cody is gonna show a brief uh, video in relationship to uh, our series. Uh, so Vaughn Gilmore is the Director of Addiction Services at the Miniger Clinic, where she leads a team of addiction professionals focused on providing integrated treatment for co-occurring psychiatric and addictive disorders. Vaughn joined the Miniger team in 2013 it has worked as a staff social worker and addictions counselor, helping both adult and adolescent patients get on the path to recovery. She focuses on evidence-based practices when providing group, individual, and family therapy interventions. Vaughn provides supervision, professional presentations, and training on a range of topics related to the assessment and treatment of substance use disorders for mental health and addiction professionals. She's a graduate of Texas Christian University, and I won't hold that against you since I went to Baylor. <laughs> okay. Vaughn obtained her master's degree in social work from the University of Texas at Arlington, and we're very pleased to have her with us today. So if you please watch this short video uh, before Vaughn comes up, uh, and I thank you for being here today. On September 8th, uh, 2017, uh, it's Friday morning, 4 a.m. We got a call from, from Jackie and said that his lips were blue. We have to remove the stigma of addiction. It's a disease. It's, it's like cancer. It is a disease that once you get, it's very difficult to cure. But there are ways uh, to get around it. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to share this series with you all, really talking about addiction and the family. Um, and I want to really initially start out by talking about what do we know about the impact of addiction on families? And then we'll talk a little bit about really what families need and then answer some of those questions. Um, so we know that really addiction is a systems issue, right? We call it a family systems issue meaning that it impacts the stability of the home, the family's unity, the mental and physical health of the family members, the finances of the family, and overall the dynamics within a family system or within a home. Um, substance misuse by a family member is stressful. Uh, I know that seems sort of simple to say, but very complicated to live, right? But it is a, um, an, an extreme stressor in many situations for the entire system. And what that means is a lot of the family members may also end up experiencing their own physical or psych psychological problems in response to the stress of a family member's addiction. So we think about what coping skills and support that a family member might need to, to manage that, right? We actually have research on sort of the type of support and coping strategies that family members need in order to sort of manage the stress themselves. And that's really what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, we also know that family members have a really critical role in supporting sort of the identified patient or the identified client, right? That outcomes are better when families are involved in treatment, that families are often the reason that people are willing to enter treatment or remain in treatment. Um, but those family members also need a lot of support and resources and skills and education in order to be able to do that 
successfully. If you have or have had a family member with a substance use disorder, um, many of these sort of emotional impacts will sound familiar um, and, and maybe uh, different feelings at different points in time, right? It's, it's really understandable for family members to feel guilt about how they've responded or not noticing sooner, right? Or how they could have intervened differently. Denial, it is also very normal for family members to um, miss warning signs early on to really be a part of sort of an initial response of denial and, and missing the severity of substance use. Uh, shame, because this is a very difficult subject to talk about. It's not one that people regularly rally around you when you are experiencing. A little bit louder. Okay, is that better? <laughs> okay, great. Um, anger, right? Anger towards yourself, um, towards your higher power, towards your loved one. All of those are normal experiences. Uh, to feel lonely and isolated, I think this goes along with the shame, right? When somebody has um, addiction or maybe they're needing to go to treatment, we don't see the same level of sort of social support and coming together, right, around those family members the way that we do with like other medical diagnoses, right? When somebody has cancer or has a baby, there's very quickly a meal train set up, right? Um, people that sort of come together, we don't see that with substance use disorders and addictive disorders. Um, many sort of reasonable experiences of sadness, fear, disappointment. The fear is really a critical one because you were thinking about how this impacts sort of the physical and psychological health of family members. Living in constant fear for your loved one's safety impacts you in terms of your sleep, right? Your quality of life, um, your, uh, your sort of your physiological responses, right? So all of these things really lead to a level of exhaustion for the family members, they are involved as well. So we actually also have quite a bit of research on what families need to cope. So sort of the problem here is that family members are, are sort of part of the impacted system. And so what do family members need to cope? Regularly, we are thinking about what the individual with the identified problem needs to cope, but we also have research on what the family needs. Um, one of those is access to accurate information. Um, if you go online and search anything about addiction, addiction treatment, you're going to find a lot of misinformation. You're going to find a lot of treatment centers willing to take advantage of vulnerable families, um, you know, sort of selling promises, right? Promises. Um, of, you know, ending addiction, these types of things out on the internet, right? So families really need access to accurate information, which is I'm so grateful for this series. Um, and that's really what I want to focus on today is a lot of accurate information and talk about some myths about addiction and recovery that are out there. And then what we actually know in the research and what is true, because access to this type of information allows people to make more informed choices about how to respond to their family members and what types of treatment they might need. Um, families also need resources and coping strategies. You know, we have three sessions together, so I hope people will come back in October and November where we'll be talking about a couple of these other sort of key things that families need, including sort of resources, recovery pathways, things that are available. Um, also skills and techniques, right? Um, there's a lot of research on ways that both professionals and family members can intervene with somebody when they have a use disorder to help get them to treatment, to help them maintain their recovery. So we will talk a little bit about that today as well, some sort of techniques that family members and professionals can use to enhance motivation and reinforce change. And then finally, families need support networks. They need community connections. Um, and I know that's been talked about in this series, and we will also talk about that more in October and November. So getting into sort of some of this education that really I think is important, um, I want to talk about some common myths, right? The first one here, 
addiction can't happen to me and my family, right? A lot of families believe this. We love each other. We have a good job, right? We know what's going on with our kids, right? There is sort of a false sense of security that it can't happen to us. But the fact is that really anyone can develop an addiction. It has nothing to do with social status, with education, with background. We do know actually some sort of pretty specific risk factors for addiction that can make people more vulnerable. So things like family history, early use, and environmental stressors. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of these things that actually leave people sort of more vulnerable. I think it's important though to have a context when thinking about risk of why people use substances. Um, now, there's a lot of different reasons that people might initially start using substances. And if you're concerned about somebody, I think it can actually be helpful to ask them these questions, right? Uh, not, not with judgment, but really to understand. Now, this is why people sort of initially use substances. We'll talk a little bit more about sort of the neurobiology of addiction, which is why people continue to use substances. But initially, especially if you have sort of adolescents or young adults, we think about why they might start using substances. Very regularly, people initially start using substances for social reasons, right? Um, this is very normal in our, in our culture, in our society. We regularly use both drugs and alcohol as ways to socialize. Alcohol often, but um, particularly in places where it has become legal, marijuana is very regularly used to socialize as well. Enhancement. A lot of times people are using substances just to um, have a positive feeling, right? That's the whole point that drugs um, create sort of a sense of euphoria and relief and not necessarily that people are even even feeling bad to begin with. They just it's it's providing a sense of enhancement. People are probably familiar with the coping. So this idea of a self medication model of addiction. Uh, it's not uncommon for people who might have trauma or anxiety or depression to start using substances as a way to self-medicate, right? So they feel bad um, and they're using to feel better. That's a little bit different than enhancement because enhancement, somebody's not necessarily feeling bad to begin with, right? Um, they just wanna feel good, right? With coping, somebody's just trying to feel normal, right? Trying to feel well. Um, conformity. Uh, this is true for adolescents, but this is also true for adults. I can't tell you how often I hear from professionals who say, but how am I going to go to a work event and not have a drink, right? The, the, the need to fit in um, very regularly um, leads to and perpetuates substance use, particularly alcohol in our culture. For young people, experimentation, often they're just curious, right? They want to try something um, young people are by nature are more risk taking, right, and curious. And so experimentation um, is sort of fits in with really their developmental trajectory. We also see people using drugs for expansion purposes. This tends to more be like, um, like hallucinogens or sort of mind altering substances where people sort of want to have like a trip or a new experience. And finally, I think it's important to include medical treatment here. Regularly, people are prescribed medications that have an addiction potential, right? So they might be prescribed um, pain medication or anxiety medications that they end up getting addicted to, right? So there's a lot of sort of routes to developing an addiction in terms of why people might initially start using substances. So I had mentioned sort of the risk factors. I wanna talk briefly about epigenetics and sort of the heritability of addiction. You may have heard sort of people say addiction runs in families, but what we know is that um, the sort of a risk for developing an addiction can be 50% or greater in terms of sort of genetics, inheriting um, not the addiction itself, but the vulnerability to it, right? The, the genetic risk to have some type of use disorder. Epigenetics has to do with the interaction between both sort of the genetics and the environmental exposure. And these things kind of are combined in terms of what we consider vulnerability or risk. Certainly there are people that do not have any family history that develop an addiction. 
and people who have a very strong family history um, and don't develop one. So this is just mm -hmm. one risk factor that we know of. So this sort of image is to try to explain the intersection of those two things, the intersection between sort of the genetics or the biology and the environment, because it's these two things together that lead to what we call addiction. So biologically, we have sort of the family history, we have sort of what we call co-occurring or mental health disorders. We have sort of biologically the effect of the drug itself. So there's lots and lots of research being done on how different drugs and, and sort of different family profiles might, different individuals might have different risks for different substances even, right? There are, for example, protective genes against becoming a nicotine smoker. Right, some genes more associated with cocaine use disorder. So there's lots and lots of interesting research being done, but in terms of like understanding like treatment, it's just helpful to know that there can sort of be this sort of neurobiological risk that has nothing to do with what's going on in somebody's life. Um, and then in the environment on the other side, we also know that early use having access to drugs and alcohol, coming from a chaotic home or an abusive home or experiencing some type of early trauma um, can all be really impactful. We know that sort of the attitudes of family members, so if there's a lot of substance use in the home, for example, this can also sort of create a vulnerability and an exposure. So that's a little bit of a, a good example too of the, the relationship between sort of environment and genetics, because if somebody comes from a family where there um, is somebody that has an alcohol use disorder, they're not only inheriting sort of the biological risk, but they're also growing up in an incredibly stressful home environment. So it's actually both at the same time. Okay, our next myth, substance use by teenagers is normal and nothing to worry about. Um, I hear this from parents a lot who think, oh, if it's just normal, they're just being a teenager, right? They're just experimenting. It's no big deal. I did that when I was a teenager. The reality is we know that early sub substance use increases somebody's risk for addiction um, pretty significantly, and that heavy substance use in teenagers also has other risks associated with it, not just addiction risk but it can actually lead to lasting changes in the brain. Hopefully that this is translating. Um, but what we know, I, I mentioned sort of the risk, young people who use alcohol or other drugs before age 15 are five times more likely to develop a substance use disorder, right? So early use really is important here in terms of predicting risk. Um, and here at the bottom, we sort of have the stages of development in terms of how addiction might impact young people at different stages. For children, it often is the impact of growing up in a home where there is substance use, stress, trauma associated with that. We know that about one in four households is actually impacted by substance use. For teenagers, this is really related to the risk taking that I mentioned. So um, it's very common for teenagers to experiment and take risks. Um, but what we know is that 90% of adults with an addiction developed that problem during adolescence. Right? When we're doing clinical interviews, we are always asking, tell me about your early use, right? We want to know about that use history, about that progression. And almost always people started using during this key sort of time of brain development. And then in young adulthood, again, the brain is still developing. And this is when we see a lot of associated consequences. And then also the highest rates of substance use disorders are among young adults. So this is ages really 18 to 25. So this is really sort of a, a developmental sort of problem. Just a few um, sort of slides to share with you in case you're interested about really what is happening in young people. These come from the Monitoring the Future survey that's conducted every year by NIDA. Um, this is from 2020 data that they put out back in December. 
Um, but basically just looking at marijuana use among um, eighth, 10th and 12th graders. So you can see that since 2010, it's been pretty steady. Um, we're seeing that about 35% of 12th graders are using marijuana in the past year versus daily use, right? Daily use is about 6.9%. It's common, but what I'm concerned about is not um, a, a young adult or a, an adolescent that's used marijuana twice in the past year, right? That's experimentation. That is sort of normal sort of trajectory. I'm concerned about the daily, weekly, habitual users of marijuana. Um, this is actually looking at eighth graders. And I included this because I really think we tend to forget about some of these other substances with young people. Um, this is looking at cough medicine, amphetamines, and inhalants. Now, cough medicines, inhalants, other prescription medications are readily available to young people, particularly if we think about middle schoolers, early high schoolers who may not have access to other types of drugs and alcohol. Um, you may have sort of heard there's been some initiatives to get people to clean out their medicine cabinets, um, you know, to look under the bathroom cabinet. Um, but this is really what we're talking about. They are able to get these types of substances at the drugstore. They can steal them um, if they're not able to buy them. And, and these types of things are incredibly concerning in terms of health risk and then also sort of predictive of longer term problems. Just some other risks for the developing brain, um, because we do really see how early these problems start um, in terms of memory problems, long-term emotion regulation problems. Um, even marijuana is demonstrated to impact things like IQ long-term, um, lots of problems with impairment in decision-making and problem-solving. And just some other associated consequences in terms of substance use in adolescence uh, that come that really complicate life, right? So the, the idea here is not to be super scary, but to say that sort of minimizing or glossing over substance use, if you have an adolescent or a young adult in your home, it comes with a lot of other risks. And we do really want to take it seriously because of the predictive nature. Another myth I hear a lot since we provide co-occurring disorder treatment at Menninger, if I get treatment for my mental health, I won't have a problem with drugs and alcohol anymore, right? People really hope that by sort of taking care of their depression symptoms or their anxiety symptoms, that that is going to resolve their issues with drugs and alcohol use. Um, which is just really not the case. We know that individuals with mental illness are more likely to experience a substance use disorder, that these two things regularly go together. And that co-occurring disorders, that's what we call it when somebody has both sort of a psychiatric diagnosis and a substance use disorder, are actually best treated with integrated treatment that addresses both at the same time. Right? The best outcomes if you are looking for treatment is both at the same time. Uh, not one and then the other. Um, a lot of times people hope that if we sort of resolve one, the other will go away on its own or they can go back to drinking or using substances recreationally. Um, but really that's not typically the case. Here you can see sort of the overlap, right? In terms of need and people that are identifying as having a problem. Um, you can see here the intersection that um, 3.8% or um, 9.5 million have both a substance use disorder and a mental illness. Um, and this is 2019 data. I would guess that maybe if we looked at 2020 data, this might be a little bit higher. It's been a really hard two years for people. But some of the common co-occurring disorders that we see associated with substance use disorder, and these can go either way. So for example, it's common for people with trauma to use substances to cope with those symptoms. Um, however, if we think about people that are using substances, they actually also become more vulnerable to trauma, right? Um, they're putting themselves in risky situations. And, and so we often see people that might've had one trauma started using and then 
during the sort of course of their use experienced additional traumas as a result of their use disorder. Um, the same thing with depressive or anxiety disorders. Some people might have a depression um, or anxiety disorder first and start using sort of to self-medicate um, and then that actually gets worse. Other people might actually develop depression because of their substance use, because of the way that it changes the brain, they might get depression after the fact. So both need to be assessed and both need to be treated. Um, ADHD is on here because ADHD is itself a risk factor for substance use disorders. People with ADHD are more impulsive, more risk-taking, and more vulnerable to addiction because of the nature of that disorder. Uh, for psychosis, we are seeing very regularly people, um, especially with sort of the higher concentrations of marijuana available now, who might have the family history, um, sort of a bipolar or a schizophrenia, they're using highly concentrated marijuana, and then they're developing psychotic disorders, right? So there's a lot of interplay between the genetics and the use happening here. Just also for reference and sort of for example, you can really see the gaps here, hopefully um, in, in terms of treatment, the number of people that need treatment versus the number of people that are able to get treatment, both for substance use and a mental illness. Another myth, addiction is a choice. Right, we talked about at the beginning some reasons that people regularly use substances, and often those are sort of choices that people are making, right? Um, but but once somebody actually has moved from substance use into addiction, we're not talking about choice anymore. That repeated exposure to a substance or a behavior leads to changes in the brain, right? Uh, particularly in areas involved in reward, motivation, and memory. And it's those changes that actually make it quite difficult for somebody to stop. So I like to think about it along a continuum. You may have heard the, somebody say like addiction is a progressive disease. And this is really what we're talking about that we've, we've talked about experimentation, um, but there's many sort of things that might happen along the way. For some people, this happens very rapidly. It can depend on the substance right, um, with a substance like alcohol or marijuana that has a lower rate of addiction per use, we might see this sort of happen slowly over time with other substances um, like methamphetamine or heroin or other opiates, we might see this happen much more quickly where somebody moves from experimentation to substance use disorder to addiction. Um, I've been using the term substance use disorder. I also will just explain that sort of diagnostically, like in a treatment setting, that's the term that somebody would use, right? So we don't actually diagnose somebody with an addiction. We use the term substance use disorder for an actual diagnosis. And that would be sort of specified like an alcohol use disorder, an opiate use disorder, a cannabis use disorder. So we think about the disease being progressive and along a continuum. And we also think about treatment needing to be along a continuum. Um, I've talked a lot about adolescents and young adults and early intervention. So you can see here, um, this is really about screening and identifying problems associated with substance use earlier. We know that before the disease progresses and people have sort of more of the sort of um, neurocognitive consequences that go along with it, recovery and treatment can actually be easier. Right. The hard part about that is convincing somebody to go to treatment before they've had some of those significant consequences. So it really becomes a bind. Treatment and recovery outcomes are better when people don't have as severe of an addiction, but when people don't have as severe of an addiction, it can be hard to get them to see that it's a problem. So when we think about treatment, we think about matching treatment with um, the appropriate level of care, depending on what's going on with that young person. And I talked about the need for accurate information. If you are looking for treatment for your loved one um, or a family member, 
ask about levels of care, right? Ask about a continuum of care. How will you help my loved one sort of reintegrate into life? Um, and don't just assume that what everybody needs is rehab or detox, right? Um, the research really says we want to treat people in the least restrictive um, level of care as possible. Um, and a good treatment center is going to have multiple levels and they're going to assess for the appropriate level of care. It should not be one size fits all, right? Um, some people can get treatment and establish sort of their recovery in intensive outpatient and some people need to start um, with detox and a residential level of care. So really ask for assessment is my recommendation. Another common myth, and I think families really get caught up in this, that we have to wait for them to hit bottom, right? Um, the problem with this is that if consequences were enough to get people to stop using drugs and alcohol, I would not have a job, right? Consequences is not why people stop, right? It, it's just not enough, right? Um, it is, again, I'm going back to the the brain and the areas related to reward, motivation, and behavior. Um, that's why people keep using substances. It's not because they don't love their family. They love their family, right? They experience intense guilt and shame about what they are doing to their family. Um, it is really this neurobiological disease that keeps people stuck in addiction, has nothing to do with hitting bottom. I know this is a, um, a really long definition. I won't read it all to you, um, but this comes from ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine. I mentioned at the beginning what families need is accurate evidence-based information. This is a great resource that has lots of information. It does have some consumer information as well. Um, but here we are defining addiction as a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. It is the dysfunction in those areas of the brain that lead to sort of compulsive and repetitive use of substances. It's not um, a characterological issue. It's not a moral issue. Um, it's not a moral failing, I think, as we have sort of previously been taught to believe that it is. Right? This is a neurobiological disease. Um, and it should be treated as such. And that often means treating it medically with a psychiatrist or an addiction medicine doctor who is looking not only at what types of therapy somebody needs, but also what types of medications do they need? What types of pharmacological interventions do they need as well to be successful? So the disease model is definitely how we understand addiction. Right. I think I've said it a lot of times, but not a disease in terms of a moral disease, right? But a disease in terms of the changes in the brain that happen with repeated exposure to drugs and alcohol. It's that repeated exposure that really changes the way the brain works. And those changes persist long after somebody stops using. Um, we see improvements in the brain, usually 12 to 18 months after somebody has sort of um, maintained complete abstinence during those 12 to 18 months on sort of brain imaging studies, we can sort of see some of the changes and the improved functioning that starts to return to the brain after that period of time. Um, but that really also depends on the severity of their use. They may not go back to where they were before, but we may still see significant improvement. Some of the common neurocognitive effects we might see with addiction um, would be cognitive deficits in terms of decision-making, impulse control, self-regulation. If we think about somebody trying to make an enormous change in their life, like stopping using drugs and alcohol, while also dealing with these neurocognitive effects, we can understand the significant relapse rates that we have, right? Um, if we're asking somebody to stop doing something while their decision-making and impulse control is impaired, right? They are going to have a hard time. If someone relapses and it's hopeless to try and help them, I know that it makes sense to feel this way when somebody is in a relapse. 
But the reality is that um, those sort of same executive functioning deficits I just talked about are what makes it so hard. And this is why we need to think about medications to reduce relapse rates, um, especially early on. Some people need to be on medications um, like naltrexone, like suboxone long term. Some people need to be on them for a year or two, right? There is nothing wrong with that. The research supports the use of medication-assisted treatment or pharmacotherapy for substance use disorders. Um, and just for reference, uh, people may have seen this before, but I think it's really important to um, put in context sort of what relapse rates are for other chronic illnesses. I think the biggest difference is not between the relapse rates, but between our approach, right? When somebody shows up to the ER because they've had an asthma attack, right? Maybe they haven't been taking their medication or they've had a flare up. No one in the ER is shaming them or stigmatizing them or blaming them for having that recurrence of symptoms, right? Um, the way that we approach people with addictions with shame, with stigma, with blame is a big part of the problem here, right? Um, we know that these types of diseases are going to have a recurrence. Um, and so how do we prepare for them? So this is a recommendation really for families um, and for individuals is planning for managing those types of setbacks. Um, I, I regularly work with patients that have been in other treatment settings. And when I say, let's, let's come up with a plan for how you're going to manage your relapse. Like they're like, what are you talking about? Why would we think of that? I'm never going to relapse. The reality is that most people will have some type of use event. Very few people get it on the first try, right? So we actually plan with our patients and our clients for what to do if they have a use event, right? So that we have a safety net. It's not permission. That's, this is not permission, this is an emergency escape plan, right? We know that individuals early in recovery, and I'm talking about 12 to 18 months as early in recovery, need both support and accountability to be successful. Um, so that may mean drug and alcohol monitoring, that may mean case management, that might be recovery management to make sure that they are successful and to catch any use very early on and intervene accordingly. I think this is our last myth. There is nothing you can do if a person is not willing to stop using. I know that the old school model out there says practice tough love, detach with love, right? You can't do anything to help them. And that's just really not accurate. We actually have lots of treatment interventions that individuals, um, family members, professionals use to target motivation to change. Um, and so we can actually help somebody move towards a decision to seek treatment, resolve their ambivalence, um, and, and make a decision. So ambivalence is really referring to that space where people aren't sure if they want to stop or not. They might know there's a problem, but might not be ready to make a change. The stages of change is really a model I recommend you ask treatment centers if they use, um, because what what a good treatment center should be doing is rec um, matching interventions to somebody's stage of change. Um, in pre-contemplation, this is sort of like denial. No, not me, I don't have a problem. I'm not going to treatment. I don't know what you guys are talking about, right? Why are you, why are you trying to get me to make a change? I don't have a problem. Um, and then people move into what we call contemplation. I do have a problem. Right. But I don't really it's not working, but I don't know that I'm ready to do anything different. Right. It's, it's causing some some consequences. This is where we get ambivalence. What happens a lot of time in treatment is um, the treatment centers assume that people are in an action stage of change. Great. You're here. Let's teach you how to stop using and let's come up with a relapse prevention plan and get you to some AA meetings. Well, if I don't even think I have a problem yet, none of that is going to be effective. So we wanna match and look for, for programs that match treatment centers to stages of change. And for family members, you can also do this as well. Um, and so what this looks like is really focusing on engagement and connection as opposed to confrontation. 
Again, I'm not talking about sort of being permissive. You need to have very clear boundaries and limits, but you can also do that while maintaining sort of the connection and focusing on being empathic. Um, so don't get into arguments is really my, my sort of first recommendation there. If you try to argue with somebody about why they need to stop using, do you know what they're going to do? They're going to argue all the reasons they don't have a problem. And what you've actually just done there is entrenched them even more in their belief that they don't have a problem. So we want to avoid argumentation. Um, we don't want to shame or stigmatize them. We want to look for self-motivating statements, any self-concerns that they have, and talk about those and reflect those back to them and agree with them about those. Um, we can also positively reinforce any efforts they have been willing to make towards change. So what that really looks like in terms of supporting motivation to change for a family member is, is matching how you're responding. And we'll probably talk about this a little bit more in our next lecture as well, um, but helping them work towards self-identified goals. What are they willing to change, right? Don't get too far ahead of them in terms of what you think they need to be doing and what they're willing to do. Um, reevaluate those goals and change the plan as needed. So I recommend, again, it's not being permissive. Um, what is it that they're willing to change? You're willing to cut back your drinking, right? Great. How many days a week and how many drinks feels reasonable to you? And what will be the plan if you cannot stick to that, right? Um, I use alcohol as an example because that's a really common one that people want to cut back and not give up completely. Um, and then we can also assist the family member with an accurate understanding of what's going on. And this is where, um, when we're focusing on that connection and they're willing to receive us, um, not in a moment of crisis, not in a moment where there's heightened emotion, not in a moment where they're using, um, share what it is like for us, right? Or provide sort of um, some feedback about what is going on with compassion. And I'm going to stop here so that we have some time for questions.